There are over 400,000 caskets at Arlington National Cemetery, but only one is lined with lead, sealed under several feet of concrete, and placed in a metal vault just to prevent it from killing you. Hello, and welcome to Doomsday, history's most dangerous podcast. Together we will rediscover some of the most traumatic, bizarre, and awe-inspiring, but largely unheard of or forgotten disasters from throughout human history and around the world. On today's episode, we'll describe the worst groin injury in the recorded history of medical science. You'll learn how to autopsy a corpse from across a room, and you're also going to hear both Kool-Aid Man and Silkwood Shower used as verbs. This is not the podcast you play around your kids, or while eating, or even in mixed company, but as long as you find yourself a little more historically engaged and learn something that could potentially save your life, our work is done. So with all that said, shoo the kids out of the room, put on your headphones and safety glasses, and let's begin. When I say Idaho, you're probably thinking of potatoes or people dying from a broken leg on the Oregon Trail. But did you know Idaho is actually an unspoiled corner of America filled with natural beauty and spectacular scenery? It's so big it runs all the way from Canada to Nevada, but it's so little understood that if I showed you Wyoming on a map and said, there it is, you'd most likely agree. Idaho is blessed with diverse landscapes, from high deserts and jagged mountains to dense forests and turquoise blue lakes. It has bubbling hot springs and roaring waterfalls. It even has canyons deeper than the Grand Canyon and more than 20 million outdoor enthusiasts venture there every year. But to make sure this doesn't start off as a kind of a bait-and-switch podcast, it's fair to say that Idaho is also home to a lot of pretty lonely and desolate places. And that's where today's story takes place. About 40 miles east of Idaho Falls, and a little town called Arco. If you're having trouble picturing it, it's basically the Phillipsburg, Montana of Idaho. According to TripAdvisor, the top recommendations for visitors to Arco are the Craters of the Moon Park, which is ideal if you're looking to Instagram yourself into the lava fields of Mordor, and the best dining can be found at Pickles Place on Front Street, home of the praiseworthy Atomic Burger. You'll think you're in a Michelin star restaurant, only in Idaho. So why are we in Idaho? Well, to answer that, first we have to travel back in time to just after the end of World War II, the ironically named sequel to World War I, The War to End All Wars. We all know World War II was most infamous for being the only times nuclear weapons had been used in combat. Russia and the United States had been fair-weather allies during the war, but as soon as Germany and Japan surrendered, all that goodwill quickly evaporated and was replaced with a lot of side-eye and competitive one-upsmanship. Nothing fuels military excess like a healthy mix of distrust and bottomless pockets. Between the two nations, they would create over 100,000 nuclear weapons. And this is a ridiculously and unusably dangerous number of weapons scientists warned that they couldn't openly rip on each other without ending the world as we know it, remodeling the earth into a kind of a global wasteland of irradiated garbage and endless winter. Eisenhower understood this. In his own words, he said, they couldn't have this kind of war because there wouldn't be enough bulldozers to scrape the bodies off the streets. And that's an actual historical quote. By the mid-1950s, the two nations had fallen into a cold war, where animated turtles taught schoolchildren how to duck and cover under their desks, and the Arctic Circle was lined with radar stations, on constant alert for the first sign of anything bigger than a sled flying overhead. Interesting thing about the Arctic, it's famously cold, and because radar stations couldn't be powered by burning furniture and frozen bodies of dead soldiers, they required endless shipments of diesel fuel. This was expensive though, and sometimes dangerous, so the army started thinking smaller. A new kind of power source was needed. And that's when Uncle Sam got into the experimental nuclear reactor business. The Argonne National Laboratory designed and ran the ultra-secretive Manhattan Project, developing the original atomic bomb. And now they were tasked with designing and building and testing a whole new kind of nuclear reactor. What the army wanted was something portable enough to be loaded onto a flatbed truck or parachuted out of a plane, and simple enough to freeball out of a manual by a small crew of enlisted personnel. They wanted it small, but what they got was small, say, compared to a Home Depot. By July of 1958, what they received was a direct cycle, natural recirculation, boiling water, experimental nuclear reactor concept, which got mercifully shortened to the less weighty Argonne Stationary Low Power Reactor No. 1, also known as the SL-1, 
It was a three-level building, about 40 feet tall, 50 feet around, something like a big stubby grain silo with a long, low administration building attached to the outside. The lowest level contained the reactor itself, the middle level housed the reactor room, and the top level was called the attic, and it collected steam from the reactor to turn back into water. So I haven't said Idaho in a minute, so back to the question. As beautiful as Idaho can be, and with apologies to Idahoans, when the Atomic Energy Commission needed about 2,300 square kilometers or 890 square miles of barren nothing to test this thing, Idaho's sagebrush desert fit the bill. They say it's about as desolate and lifeless as the moon, the perfect place to hide an experimental nuclear reactor. Or maybe even an experimental nuclear reactor mishap? Let us meet the cast of our story that manned the station on the miserably cold night of January the 3rd, 1960. Army Specialist John Burns was a handsome 22-year-old from Utica, New York. He joined the SL-1 staff the year before, moving to Idaho with his 19-year-old wife Arlene, who must have been ecstatic, and their one-year-old son, who was only one and couldn't have cared less. John's hobbies included ignoring his family, chatting up strippers, and throwing temper tantrums at work. Burns was said to be always up for a laugh. He once turned off a fan that cooled critical instrument systems just to watch his crewmates freak out, and at least one time he was found asleep in the parking lot when he was supposed to be monitoring the reactor. At first blush, yes, this was unspeakably negligent and dangerous, but in his defense, he had a baby barely out of high school, and raising kids can be very tiring. Next came Navy CB Richard Legg, who joined the staff at the same time. With the successful launch of the nuclear submarine USS Nautilus, naval students looking to get an early foot in the door or hatch or whatever subs use would sign up to train on nuclear equipment at Idaho Falls. He was a stocky 26-year-old from Michigan who traveled to Idaho to advance his career and ended up finding love in the arms of a Mormon girl. Everything was looking up for Leg. He'd already worked two years as a Navy electrician before enrolling in the SL-1 program. He'd even been in the same class as Burns back in Virginia. Around 4 p.m. on January 3rd, Burns and Legg began their shift at the SL-1. Assisting them that night was 28-year-old trainee specialist Richard Leroy McKinley. He was a family man from Ohio who had served in both the Army and Air Force during the Korean War. Right before the holidays, another crew had shut down the reactor for routine maintenance, and tonight's job for the three men was to simply grab a clipboard and prep it for a restart. And if you're thinking, oh no, that sounds dangerous, something dangerous is going to happen, just calm down, you have no idea. To understand just how much so, now's probably a good time to quickly Coles notes the basics of power generation. The entire industrial revolution was based on the idea that water turns into steam. Power plants would burn coal to boil water, which turned into steam. The steam spun a turbine, and the turbine generated electricity. Nuclear power plants work the same way, but instead of burning coal, they split neutrinos from uranium atoms, which release a ton of energy in the form of heat, which then boils the water, which then spins the turbines. Same idea. And you might say, Professor, isn't splitting atoms inherently dangerous? And I would answer, Yes, but I'm not a professor, and it would be incalculably stupid not to have some kind of brakes you could throw on these things if they started feeling all chernobyl -y. And that's where control rods come in. An easy way to understand how they work is to imagine 1960s heartthrob Kirk Douglas. Imagine young Kirk Douglas attached to a device that lowered him into and out of a room full of people. His presence would immediately begin to absorb all the attention. And scientists could control the amount of attention he absorbed by raising and lowering him in and out of the room. Engineers control the rate and intensity of nuclear reactions by raising and lowering control rods. Need more energy? Lift the rod. Want less? Lower it. Tonight was Legg's first shift as the crew chief. He'd been promoted to supervisor over Burns, which he didn't much care for. Turns out, they'd never really gotten along. They kinda hated each other. The two men had even come to blows at a bachelor party at Burns' beloved strip club just the year before. If drunkenly defending the honor of a stripper at two in the afternoon on a weekday made him wrong, Burns didn't want to be right. The three-man crew on the evening shift had a large number of tasks to perform on the operating room floor, and there was no one left in the control room to keep logbooks or monitor the plant conditions. The men had already cleaned out the reactor housing, reinstalled the plugs, reassembled the control rods, and replaced the shield blocks. The only box left unchecked was to reconnect the reactor's control rods to the drive mechanism, which looked like a mix of an industrial plunger and the Genesis device from Wrath of Khan. The first step of the last step was to lower all five control rods, but only three dropped cleanly to the core under their own weight. The other two would need to be forced in by the Genesis plunger. In the year before, there had been about 40 cases of control rods sticking doing this. It happened about four times in the last month alone. 
Each time it was chalked up to a misalignment, or surface corrosion, or worn out bearings, or something called radiation-induced swelling of materials. If you know the Simpsons episode where Mr. Burns put together a team of ringers for the plant baseball team and Ken Griffey Jr. couldn't play because he'd been overindulging on a nerve and brain tonic and came down with a case of cranial gigantism, it's a little like that. Burns and McKinley had to stand on the reactor core to lift out the rods so they could be hooked to the drive mechanism, like we said, simple, like hanging a coat on a hook, except the coat is 7 feet tall and it weighs about 84 pounds, and today it wasn't cooperating. It's easy to imagine their frustration standing on top of the reactor housing, tugging and kicking and cursing the equipment. Leg was off working on a different control rod by the time Burns finally managed to work the rod loose. All he needed to do now was lift it to connect it to the machine. About 3 inches would do. According to the manuals, anything more than 12 inches would increase the rate of reaction enough to put them at risk of an explosion. And what Burns did next would be investigated for 2 years and create decades of debate and speculation. He lifted the control rod enough to hook it to the machine, and then some, about 26 and a half inches in total. Now imagine you're the assistant fire chief at the test site's fire and security department when an alarm goes off. It's the SL-1. You sigh. You've already been out to the SL-1 twice because of a faulty detector, and now you're being called out again into the freezing January night air to double check what is obviously another false alarm. You pull up to the building, again, and everything seems fine, again. You see a little steam coming out of the building, which makes sense because it's 20 below zero or minus six Fahrenheit, no reason for concern. As you enter the building, the control room pulsed with a yellow glow from radiation warning lights, Red October style. The thing is, you weren't thinking about radiation on the way over. When the alarm comes in, it just tells you where to go, not what to expect. After a quick search, the control building turned out to be empty. Nothing but a bunch of lunch pails and coats on hangers. So unless the man ran into the desert without their coats, they had to be in the reactor building. You turn off the alarm and you check your radiation detector, and as soon as it turns on, the reading immediately jumps off the scale. You make a mental note to request a less defective radiation detector and begin the long climb up the metal staircase that winds around the building to reach the reactor room on the second floor. By the time you get to the top of the stairs, the radiation detector actually shorts out, and maybe melts a little in your hand, and maybe a bit of your mustache falls off. The rest of your men remember something they forgot back at the truck and leave. The reaction would be perfectly understandable. Low levels of radiation are honestly not all that dangerous, all things considered. Medium levels can lead to sickness, headaches, vomiting, and fever. But high levels, they'll kill you by damaging or turning off your internal organs, they'll burn off your skin, they'll even destroy your nervous system, and when this happens, you'll experience seizures and tremors as the radiation rips apart your blood cells while your immune system causes uncontrollable bleeding. And the worst part of it, if you get blasted by radiation and it doesn't outright kill you, now you have to wait, which could take years. Radiation could kill you in many ways, but none of them are quick or painless. But you, more concerned about duty and the safety of the maintenance crew, continue alone. You open the door to the reactor room to take a peek inside, but instead of calling out for the missing men, you scream, OH MY GOD, while throwing up, and then you Kool-Aid man your way through the nearest wall oh into the freezing night air and your reaction would be perfectly understandable. Why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> After your fellow emergency workers are finished slapping you in the face to break your hysteria, you struggle for adjectives to describe the horror you just witnessed, and you make the call for backup, which came from everywhere. Alarms were even sounded as far away as Washington. With the control rod removed and without anything controlling the nuclear reaction beneath their feet, the fission had increased exponentially, leaving the men very little time to escape the room before what came next. The biggest understatement in this podcast is where I just said that the men had very little time to escape the room. The core quickly superheated. Even being submerged in coolant water wasn't enough to keep the fuel plates from vaporizing. And here's something you probably don't know about water. When it vaporizes super fast, it expands up to 1700 times its original volume. That means every square foot of water in the reactor became enough scalding steam to fill a condo. The reactor had been built strong enough to keep it from exploding under pressure. But all that steam and water needed somewhere to go. So up it went. It hit the lid of the reactor vessel at about 160 feet per second and with about 10,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. That's per square inch. That's more than three times more pressure than you'd feel having a bullet impact your skin. But every inch of your skin? This is the kind of pressure you normally only will find 21,000 feet under the ocean. To really appreciate what happened in that room, two things. First, blink. The average blink takes somewhere between 300 and 400 milliseconds, and everything I've described to this point, the reaction in the core and what happened in the room, 
happened in four milliseconds. Like, you could chew off a finger and still count it out on one hand. 4.0 milliseconds. That is four one-thousandths of a second. Compared to the explosion of the reactor, a blink is practically an eternity. Second, on a good day, the reactor was designed to generate three megawatts of power. That's roughly enough to power about 3,000 homes, depending on the season and the usage and blah blah blah. But without the calming effect of the now partially removed control rod, the power spiked 6,300 times its normal limit, creating 20 gigawatts of power. That's enough to power 20 million homes. That's enough to send Doc and Marty back and forth through time 16 and a half times. I say at least because no machine on Earth was designed to harness this kind of power. So 20 gigawatts is really where the meter pegged and broke. And now, I'm about to describe Leg, Burns, and McKinley's injuries. And to preface this, I'm going to say that when the men were first found, they were misidentified. The rescue workers were people who had met them, who knew them and had spent time with them. But the injuries were so elaborate, they defied recognition. So if you're not down with gross, you can pretty well fast forward through most of the rest of the podcast until about the end where I thank you for listening and give you a hint about our next episode. You have been warned. So... Imagine being thrown sideways across a room and into a wall in about the time it takes to blink. Burns was caught by giant concrete retaining blocks, and his face, throat, ribcage, left arm, left leg, and back were completely crushed on impact. I don't know how you crush both your face and your back at the same time, but clearly some kind of Cirque du Soleil stuff was going on. On top of that, if you can picture it, his pelvis was found shoved up into his abdomen, and I'll wager my physiology degree that your hip bones were never meant to touch your lungs. Certainly he would have died from the cranial or spinal trauma, but the impact into the concrete broke his ribs and drove them inwards, like a hand closing. The jagged edge of one of those rib fingers pierced his heart. Of all the things wrong with him, getting stabbed through the heart was listed as the actual cause of death. McKinley was also thrown across the room, but somewhere between the reactor and the wall, as he spiraled and ragdolled through the air, he was shot down like a clay pigeon at a target shooting range. A chunk of radioactive reactor shrapnel hit him right in the head, but it didn't pierce his skull. It must have been kind of a glancing blow, which is good, but it did tear off half his face, which was bad, which flew away at great speed and landed somewhere with a wet splack. Here's where things get technical. You've probably heard of abrasions before, but have you ever heard of an avulsion? An abrasion is an owie. An avulsion is where part of the body is deeply peeled away or torn away by trauma. And I don't mean like an arm blew off. Avulsions most commonly refer to a surface trauma where all of the skin's different layers are removed, creating a kind of a peekaboo flap for all of the deeper subcutaneous tissue, muscle, tendons, and bone. It's kind of a rare chance for your skeleton and organs to get a little sunlight. But technically speaking, McKinley's injuries were even more intense than they sound. So what he had was a specific subtype of avulsion called degloving, and I'll just say it's extensive and bad, and the best reason not to go to medical school, and not the kind of thing you want to Google image search. The name was inspired by the process of removing a glove. McKinley had major injuries to his scalp, face, eyes, left hand, and left leg. He must have looked like all the best props from a Halloween store cobbled together. And if your shoulders haven't been creeping up into your ears for the last few minutes, it's time we play a game of Would You Rather? Would you rather suffer Burns' full body smushing, McKinley's horrific and lethal game of catch, or risk it all on what happened to Leg? Either just tweet us or shout your answer into your listening device of choice. And now, without further ado, I will explain why Burns and McKinley were the lucky ones. Which sounds weird to say. Remember that ridiculous pressure wave I described when the water hit the reactor lid? This ridiculous amount of force was able to lift all 26,000 pounds of the core, 13 feet straight up. Sadly for Leg, the reactor didn't stop its upward movement because of Newton's law of gravity. It stopped because of Newton's first law of motion, which, if you'll remember correctly, was the one where an object will stay in motion until it is affected by another force. And in this case, the restricting force was the ceiling which the reactor hit hard before falling back to its original point, only in much worse shape. The jump sheared all of its connections to the piping and instrument systems. The collision left the ceiling deeply punched in and peppered with shield plugs and rod fragments, and Leg was no longer standing on the reactor lid. The top of his head had been sliced off, exposing his brain. His face was collapsed inward. The upper half of his body had been twisted 180 degrees against the lower half, 
and his left leg was cut almost in two like the way you cook a hot dog. And here's where it gets gross. His internal organs had been displaced and destroyed because of his greatest injury. See, when the reactor returned to Earth and leg was no longer on it, it was because he had been pancaked into the ceiling, probably with a mighty wet scroosh, and stapled into place, impaled through the groin by a shield plug. The plug entered through the groin, but exited through his shoulder, so figure that one out. Or roll around on the floor cradling your junk, there's no real wrong answer here. So to recap, Burns had been killed by his injuries. Leg had been killed spectacularly by the worst groin injury in the history of medical science. And as easy as it is to think, surely these men died in the most ridiculously agonizing ways in the storied history of human death. But McKinley, and this is the most amazing part, McKinley was still alive, which would have put a smile on the remaining half of his face if he probably wasn't in a coma. More emergency workers and staff arrived with even better equipment. One of the men racing to the scene was Ed Viario, a health physicist responsible for the SL-1 reactor. Viario and another man were next to climb to the reactor building, this time wearing fully pressurized body suits and with gamma ray detectors. When the men approached the reactor room, their detectors hit 500 rentgen per hour, which is enough to kill the less than two minutes. Now ordinarily, army engineers would have just bulldozed a mountain over the whole site and called it a day. But when the man found McKinley, moaning and twisting his body as if he was still trying to operate the reactor, the mission changed from a recovery to a rescue. By 10.30 that night, five men wearing radiation badges and full pressure suits attempted to remove McKinley from the building. They each took turns dragging him closer to freedom, but because they kept voiding the warranty on every Geiger counter they owned, they estimated the radiation in the room was about a thousand rentgens per hour which is a little like getting 25 dental x-rays a second for every second you spend in the room. 450 rentgens is called a median lethal dose. 600 will destroy your gastrointestinal tract and kill you dead in anywhere from 2 to 12 weeks. So this was the sandbox they were playing in. Anyone entering the building was allowed a maximum of 65 seconds exposure. Viario took a stopwatch and a giant wrench to bang on the wall to make sure rescuers knew when their exposure time was up. Knowing they only had a minute, the first men ran into the room and immediately slipped and fell. The floor had been covered in water and iron pellets used for thermal insulation and radiation shielding. These worked best inside the reactor, but now they were unexpectedly scattered all over the ground like props in some kind of home alone role play. Panicky breathing fogged their face masks, and as they hurriedly tried to load McKinley onto a stretcher and haul him outside, before someone had to come and put their bodies on a stretcher, their respirators malfunctioned. They were forced to remove their masks and inhale the unfiltered, contaminated air of the reactor room in order to check them. Viario knew McKinley had already absorbed a lethal dose of radiation and would never survive his injuries, but rather than mercy killing him with a timing wrench, he had a driver wrap him in lead blankets and drive him out into the sagebrush desert in one of those old-timey Ghostbuster-style ambulances till they could figure out what to do with him. He died almost the moment he reached the ambulance, and the nurse who helped guide his body into the ambulance would join him two years later. To think about how ridiculously radioactive his body was, using dental x-rays as a unit of measurement, a dental x-ray will give you about 100 microsieverts of radiation. McKinley's body was barfing out about 4.5 million microsieverts, which works out to about 45,000 simultaneous dental x-rays. Rather than putting a brick on the gas pedal and making him Canada's problem, McKinley was covered in lead blankets and left in the ambulance. To reduce the radioactive load, they removed his clothing. They had to use tools to cut off his overalls, which were soaking from the reactor and had frozen solid in the freezing night air. Meanwhile, back at the SL-1, emergency workers still had no idea where Leg was, but knowing that everyone was probably dead, they were able to work slower and more carefully. And here was the plan to find him. A photographer would run into the reactor room, snap as many random pics of the space as they could in 30 seconds, and run back out. Any longer than that and the radiation would probably destroy the film in the camera. Once the pictures were developed, they could take their time trying to identify his secret hiding spot. I can only imagine the look on their faces when they discovered the image of Leg, splorked into the ceiling, hanging there like a dead bug. The damage to the reactor had been severe, and they didn't know if it could go critical again, so they wanted to keep anything from falling into it. They were concerned that if a piece of Leg peeled free and fell into it, it might cause the reactor to China Syndrome its way through the floor. To make things more difficult, the space directly above the reactor was bathed in the most intense radiation levels, so a plan was devised. They would bring in an industrial crane to squeegee like from the ceiling, like a fruit roll-up. I'm only kidding. What they actually did was at least a hundred times worse. They forced open a large freight door in the side of the silo to allow a crane into the building, and the crane carried a 5 by 20 foot stretcher, which was positioned over the reactor, but directly beneath the body, 
Two-man teams in pressure suits, again working no more than 65 seconds at a time, ran into the reactor room with sharp hooks on poles to try and pull McKinley's body free. The stretcher was there to catch what the men clawed down. The crane operator worked behind a lead shield, guided by radio, and probably with some kind of lead basket in his lap to throw up in. One stoic rescuer with a gift for understatement and the strongest stomach in the history of the armed services described Leg's body as not easily recognizable. It actually took six days to scrape all of them down. And the strangest thing was that his body showed every kind of physical trauma except for decay. Any microbes that would normally begin decomposing a body after it dies were quite dead themselves. He'd basically been irradiated the same way they sterilize foods to kill insects and microorganisms to extend shelf life. But in all seriousness, what should you do if you were in this situation? In an actual emergency, like a nuclear power plant accident or the touchdown of a nuclear missile, the Centers for Disease Control has strong recommendations. And the best advice? Get yourself inside a building and hunker down. Any little bit of dirt and dust thrown into the air becomes radioactive and then falls back from the sky, contaminating everything it touches, and can spread in the same way dust or mud gets tracked into your house. It quickly and silently spreads to other people and objects. To get into the appropriately skeeved out headspace for thinking about radioactive contamination, think of it like you were wearing a dusting of spiders. You want them off your body as quick as possible. Just removing your outer layer of clothing can remove up to 90% of radioactive spiders. You want to bag up those rags and stay away from them too. Again, because spiders, you're going to want to scrub. Like, silk would shower yourself. But don't use conditioner. It turns out, conditioner can bond radioactive elements to your hair. It's honestly not even a bad idea just to shave your head at this point. As radioactive material settles on the outside of buildings, the best thing you can do is stay as far away from the walls and roof of the building as you can. Now, same scenario. You're outside and you just saw a cloud that looks like a mushroom, but there's no shelter around. At a minimum, cover your mouth and nose with a mask, a cloth, a towel, or anything you can find to scream into. The idea is to reduce the amount of radioactive material you breathe in or absorb through your skin. In the best case scenario, you find a nice thick blanket to cover yourself with while you find a new home, say down a sewer or inside of a hollow tree. Because radioactivity loses potency over time, you're going to want to stay in that sewer tree for at least 24 hours. Staying inside for at least 24 hours is a good rule of thumb you can use to protect you and your family. In a US government film later made about the SL1 accident, the narrator said that the bodies had been successfully decontaminated and returned to their families, which wasn't entirely true. Particles of nuclear fuel had penetrated into each of their bodies, essentially reducing them to nuclear waste. But before that nuclear waste could be interred, it had to be autopsied. The autopsy process wasn't that much different or less dangerous or less gross than the recovery process. A picture a line above coroners in protective suits waiting in a line outside a morgue while a doctor banged a wrench against the wall every 65 seconds. Using all available tools attached to 10-foot poles, the doctors open the bodies and remove the organs before using radiation detectors, also on 10-foot poles, to help them decide what was too radioactive to keep. Huge swaths of skin and organs were put into steel drums. McKinley lost an arm. Burns lost both legs. Leg lost both arms, both legs, and his head. The site for containing radioactive waste was 26 kilometers or 16 miles away, and debris from the accident was way too dangerous to move that far out over open roads, so instead, a new site was commissioned about half a mile northeast of the SL-1. There was no record of ever finding the other half of McKinley's face. So what happened? A lot of the standard safety measures we take for granted were absent from the SL-1 design. It was designed without a concrete containment structure, and was wrapped in simple sheet metal. It was only ever intended to be used in remote, isolated areas, so if something went wrong and a bunch of seals and three-eyed penguins paid the price, then so be it. That's their attitude, not mine. Obviously, the removal of the control rod doomed everyone, but the who's and why's would dog investigators for decades. One theory was that because the control rods were shown to corrode and flake over time, it made them less effective, meaning that as more material flaked off the outsides, that meant the reactor had become more excitable. The rods didn't have to be removed quite as far to create a surplus of nuclear reactions because the protective material had been flaking off. But why point fingers at equipment when you have staff? Another theory was because McKinley was still a trainee, he may have accidentally done something to trigger the disaster, but his body had been found farthest from the reactor, so not likely. No, it was definitely Burns who lifted the rod, and a million different ways of accidentally lifting it were tested. My favorite theory was whether goosing was to blame. If you don't know what that is, it's the idea of someone stealthily sneaking up from behind and pinching or poking Burns in the butt. The question was whether he would have jumped or straightened up, killing everyone in the room. They actually tested this on almost a dozen unsuspecting investigators, but they couldn't recreate the results. 
The most popular and exciting theory was that Byrne had done it on purpose. The Atomic Energy Commission investigation stated that Byrne's marriage had been in trouble for some time, and the Christmas break had only made things worse. He'd been spending less and less time at home, and around 7 o'clock on the night of the accident, the testing station operator had placed a call through to the control room at the SL1. It was Byrne's wife, Arlene. They spoke briefly before he hung up and returned to work. Although he barely reacted, to all accounts, Arlene had decided that that evening was the perfect time to let him know that she was looking for a divorce. The commission also believed that it was possible Leg had been sleeping with Byrne's wife. So the question becomes, what does all this do to his state of mind? There's no way to say. Just because he wasn't freaking out and screaming says nothing about his mental state, because mental state is never perfectly obvious. At a minimum, Burns was probably not focusing as well as he could have that night. But was he in a tub of ice cream and Bridget Jones' diary state of mind? Or a, I'm gonna murder suicide my whole crew state of mind? We'll never know. One thing's for sure. Unless you're a circus strongman or a professional wrestler, you don't just pull 84 pounds straight up by accident. Just saying. Some investigators said it would require an intentional or highly reckless act in order to manually overlift a stuck rod enough to cause the accident. Sabotage or suicide by one of the operators, or even a murder-suicide may sound crazy, but investigators learned that the idea of an operator going rogue and blowing up a plant wasn't. When former crews were asked, did you know the reactor would go critical if the central control rod removed? They answered, of course, we talked about it often, what we would do if we were at a radar station and the Russians came. We'd yank it out, like a pin from a grenade. A nuclear grenade. When Three Mile Island had popped off back in 1979, people went nuts. The China Syndrome movie had just come out, so they were really nervous, so they grabbed their kids out of school and headed for the hills, fearing that nuclear material would melt all the way to the Earth's core. But in 1961, in Idaho, the reaction of local residents was described as minimal. They didn't seem to be able to muster any considerable alarm that the SL-1 posed any serious threat to their safety. Even though the removal of the radioactive waste and disposal of the three bodies eventually exposed 790 people to harmful levels of radiation, it would take two years to finish an investigation into an accident that lasted all of two seconds. No actual guilt or blame could be found, and it would be irresponsible to lay it on the operators in the absence of hard evidence. Without a living witness to Judge Byrne's state of mind, and most of the physical evidence deadly to the touch and buried under tons of Idaho and basalt in the sagebrush desert, there's no way to say. All we can know for sure is that by all accounts, these men were dicks. But that aside, they did legitimately die in service to their country. Special and completely unprecedented burial precautions were taken. Before each funeral, an extra deep grave was excavated and a foot-thick layer of concrete was poured as a pad. Each of the bodies had been wrapped like a mummy in cotton sheeting, then plastic, followed by several hundred pounds of lead sheeting. They were then placed in hermetically sealed metal caskets, welded shut and sealed for all time. The caskets were then placed atop the concrete base and sealed in concrete inside of a metal vault, reaching 10 feet into the ground. Above that, an additional slab of concrete was poured, and above that, three more feet of earth, and the following note of internment. Quote, Victim of nuclear accident. Body is contaminated with lifelong radioactive isotopes. Under no circumstances will the body be moved from this location without prior approval of the Atomic Energy Commission in consultation with this headquarters. John Burns is buried in his hometown of Utica, New York. Because of his service, Richard McKinley was interred at Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. If you're looking, his body is very close to the main visitor center parking lot. Richard C. Legg's body was folded with dignity like a flag and buried in Kingston, Michigan. The funeral themselves were limited to eight minutes, with the grieving families kept at least 20 feet away from the vaults. But Legg's family wasn't having it. They demanded the casket be removed from the vault for last rites, which was allowed, but since the radiological exposure was basically doubled, the service was cut in half to four minutes. If you've ever been to a funeral that required the use of a Geiger counter, please let us know. It took 475 people 18 months to remove all the contaminated waste. Testing of the air, water, soil, animals, milk, and vegetation revealed very little contamination, and life went on as normal in the surrounding areas. The SL-1 program was scrapped, but a lot was learned. The whole experience was a real eye-opener, but also a face melter. Since the disaster, new reactor designs have eliminated the need for hands-on interactions with control rods, and new safety measures meant no control rod could be physically pulled past a certain point. Procedures and training got more intense too, and planning for emergencies increased. Throughout its history, the U.S. Nuclear Laboratory at Idaho Falls, currently known as the Idaho National Laboratory, had been home to 52 different nuclear reactors, and is the largest concentration of nuclear reactors anywhere in the world, 
and of course that meant nuclear waste continued to pile up on the site for decades. Today, all three of the reactors have been decommissioned. But maybe in some future episode we'll be covering the story of the 300,000 people who rely on the Snake River Aquifer for their drinking water, which, as it turns out, happens to sit directly beneath the SL-1 burial site. Well, we hope you enjoyed our episode on the world's first peacetime nuclear accident and the only fatal nuclear accident in US history. A disaster like this is almost always due to a series of contributing factors. In this case, the error may have been caused by the flawed technical design of the reactor, or it may have been the act of a flawed human being, but without the equipment and operator exposing each other's flaws and taking advantage for the worst possible result, none of it may have ever happened at all. So, dear listeners, what's the worst thing you've ever seen at work? You can find us on Twitter and Facebook as Doomsday Podcast, or fire us an email to doomsdaypod at gmail.com. Older episodes will eventually be found wherever you found this one, and while you're there, please leave us a review and tell your friends. And tell your friends a five-star review helps like-minded history buffs discover the show. On a more serious note, if you or someone you care about is experiencing thoughts of self-harm or suicide, please understand you are not alone, and there are good people who are ready and happy to help. They're only a Google search away, or you can call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. We need to keep every listener we can. If you want to help support the production of the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash funeral kazoo. If you're after cool episode-specific swag, you're welcome to join us at evilreindeershop.com. But if you can spare the money and had to choose, we actually ask you to consider making a donation to Global Medic. Global Medic is a rapid response agency of Canadian volunteers offering assistance around the world to aid in the aftermath of disasters and crises. They are often the first and sometimes the only team to get critical interventions to people in life-threatening situations, and to date, they've helped 3.6 million people across 75 different countries. You can learn more and donate at globalmedic.ca. And on that note, our next episode may actually be worse, if you like your body counts egregious, that is. On the next episode, snakes and ants and lava, oh my! We're visiting a disaster so unique, we had to invent a whole new term just to describe it. It's the St. Pierre Volcanic Bioswarm of 1902. We'll talk soon. Safety goggles off, and thanks for listening.